Uh, okay, so let me remind you what I uh, did yesterday. So you know, we have this basic invariant. We have a surface, k points fixed, p1 through pk on m. And we have these parameters, beta 1 through beta k. And we're looking for conic metrics with cone angle 2 pi times 1 plus beta j. And uh, so we have the fundamental invariant chi of m plus the sum of beta j. And this is, uh, I can write this as chi of m beta, sort of the vector beta here. So this is like a, uh, an orbifold Euler characteristic or a conic Euler characteristic. And so in particular, this, uh, the sign of this determines if I'm going to have a chance of finding a constant curvature metric, it's going to determine the, uh, uh, the sign of the curvature. So, um, and this came of, and this naturally appeared when I applied Gauss-Binet on the complement of small disks and took a limit. Okay, so um, yesterday we talked about the case where chi of m, so first we talked about the case where chi of m beta equals zero, and then we have a linear problem, purely linear problem. And we found that the uh, solution, uh, so remember that I, so there I started with, uh, let's say, g tilde, which is equal to a smooth metric on M. And I'm trying to solve, uh, so the way I formulated it was Laplacian g tilde of u uh, is equal to k g tilde, but then I added the sum beta j times uh, delta pj. Okay, so I thought of the curvature as being uh, concentrated at a uh, delta functions of the curvature of the conic metric is being concentrated into delta functions. And this uh, formulation of it gave me a uh, good insight that u should be written as the sum of beta j times, uh, and I guess I wanted a 2 pi here, sorry, beta j times the Green's function. So this is just the Green function for g tilde, j goes from 1 to k, plus u tilde, where u tilde is smooth. Okay, so this green function has asymptotics in local coordinates, so g of z, pj, so in coordinates where pj is equal to zero, this looks like um, log of mod z. Okay, so altogether, when I look at e to the 2u times g tilde, this up to a, some smooth multiple is going to look like mod z to the 2 beta j times mod dz squared. So this was the other form of conic metric. So conformally in two dimensions, it's just conformally smooth, and, uh, and all the action happens in some sort of conformal action, you know, in some sort of extra um, smooth factor, so smooth positive factor there, but this captures the conic singularity completely. Okay, so it's a linear problem, and uh, the, you know, we solve this using more or less garden variety uh, elliptic analysis, just using the fact that the right-hand side is in some negative order Sobolev space, and then we had a good guess for what the solution could be and then applied elliptic regularity to say that the remainder term was smooth. Okay, so that was uh, the, linear, uh, the, the linear case when chi is zero. Then the next case when chi of m beta is negative, we have to solve a genuinely nonlinear equation. So we let g naught be conic with the right cone angles. So we have a good guess for how to write down the cone angles. We just choose a metric that looks like this near each of the conic points, and we perturb off of it. So I'm trying to look for g, which is e to the 2u, g naught. And, uh, and so then we have to solve Laplacian g naught u minus k naught minus e to the 2u is equal to 0. And so then we followed exactly the same procedure as in the smooth case. Namely, we used the method of barriers. We could find sub and super solutions to this equation. OK, so we use um, the method of barriers. And the new ingredient here was that we're solving the Laplacian or Laplacian minus lambda on a, uh, for a conic metric, for a, a, a metric of conic singularities. And I stated the basic uh, Fredholm theorem here. Okay? Now, I'm going to be uh, talking about that in uh, greater detail tomorrow. So I want to pursue sort of further geometric aspects today. But um, the, the key to this was to understand the mapping properties of Laplacian g naught or Laplacian g naught minus lambda. So we needed to understand this. This was a singular operator, which remember, if I wrote it in polar coordinates near z equals 0, if I used uh, polar coordinates in, a, well, geodesic polar coordinates for the metric g naught, this thing looked like, so Laplacian g naught 
looks like uh, d by dr squared plus 1 over r d by dr plus uh, 1 over beta, let me see, 1 plus beta, j squared, r squared, d by d theta squared, plus higher order terms. Okay, so it's a, a, a sort of a regular singular type operator. Operators of this type are called conic. I explained sort of the larger context of, you know, general nth order conic operators, and I hinted at the fact that there's sort of a general strategy, general methodology for dealing with these that uh, parallels what one does for operators in smooth manifolds if you're of a certain change, uh, turn of mind, which is that you uh, have a calculus of pseudo differential operators, which are just operators which generalize the green function. Okay, so they're integral operators that have certain singularities along the diagonal, and there's a very well understood and classical picture that uh, uh, goes back not quite centuries, but decades, many decades. And there's an analog of all of that for, uh, for uh, um, conic operators, and as I suggested, also for operators with more complicated types of singularities. Okay, so we have some strategy for understanding this, and we also had a regularity theorem, so that was sort of the other big point. And that told me how, when I solved the successive stages of the iteration, so if I solved Laplace and G naught minus lambda of uj plus 1 is equal to whatever the right-hand side was, f of x uj, so I had to solve equations like this iteratively, uh, I start off with u naught being something, you know, maybe the initial guy is some u bar, the subsolution. This was smooth, and then that actually told me exactly how regular u1 was, and then u2, and then u3, so we had precise regularity statements all along the way. So each of these uj's look like a constant, so a0, this depends on j, plus a11j times uh, cosine theta plus a12j sine theta times r to the 1 over 1 plus beta j plus, oh, excuse me, different j's, I apologize. Um, sorry, I'll call this L. So this is the term of the sequence, and then I have the, the jth cone angle. I'm sorry, plus big O of r squared. Okay, so I had a very precise regularity statement at every stage of the uh, problem. So this is just a linear statement about regularity. Uh, and then I used this to derive a maximum principle. So remember, the problem was that the maxima or minima might occur at the, uh, uh, at the um, uh, cone, cone points, and we used this regularity statement to prevent that. And so we finally got a sequence of functions so that u bar is equal to u naught less than u1 is less or equal to u upper bar, and that allowed us to take a convergent subsequence, and finally we are going to get the same, so we get a solution to this equation. That's sort of the limit of all of these uh, uh, iterative equations. So if I take the limit as L goes to infinity in these guys. And then finally, the thing which I'd stated, and I, I sort of uh, conflated the two things, but I have exactly the same sort of regularity statement for the actual solution of the nonlinear problem. Okay. So these were all the steps that we did for the, uh, for the uh, negative case. And, um, you know, the thing I want to stress is, you know, it's basically linear analysis. I mean, of course, it's a little bit trumped up, so to speak. Um, but, uh, you know, it's basically linear analysis, and it's not very sophisticated PDE. Okay. Okay, so then the last thing I did yesterday was starting to look at the case chi of m beta is positive, and I made the assumption that all of the beta j's are negative, which corresponds to the cone angles less than 2 pi. And this corresponds to the really uh, important geometric property that if I take a minimizing geodesic from any point to any other point, it never goes through a cone point in its interior. Okay, so it's a very geometric property, and that follows directly from this hypothesis here. Okay. So, and then what I concluded with it was this beautiful fact that, um, so let me use this as my starting point for the next discussion. So, the beautiful fact is that if uh, there exists a spherical cone metric, G, with, uh, so spherical just means K is equal to plus one. So if there exists a spherical cone metric G with all cone angles less than 2 pi, 
that corresponds to all b to j is negative. Then you have the following inequalities that b to j is greater than the sum i not equal to j of b to i, and this is true for all j. Okay, and these are called the Troyanov constraints. And the way I derived it was kind of this very geometric way. I sort of talked about the Dirichlet polygon for the spherical cone surface. So I took the spherical cone surface and developed it onto the football. So I could sort of think about the whole surface as living, uh, as being sort of obtained by edge identifications from some sort of polygon, which lives in this football. And then the defect between this and this is exactly that area, which is positive. Okay, so it's a very geometric idea. Now, Troyanov, when he proved the theorem of existence, so what I stated, and we'll uh, sketch the proof of today, is that these turn out, this turns out to be necessary and sufficient for existence in the case where the cone angles are less than 2 pi. So the proof is extremely different than anything I've done so far. Uh, and he came across this condition from a very different point of view. Okay, so I'm now going to talk about existence. And I'm first going to talk about a strategy that uh, one can use even in the negative case. It's, it turns out to be much easier. Um, but suppose I have uh, uh, two metrics. So again, I'm going to have g, which is equal to e to the 2 u g naught. Same sort of thing. And suppose I want g to have some constant curvature as a specified function. It may or may not be constant. So this is an old problem, the Nirenberg problem, very closely related. Uh, and so the way that it's often been attacked in positive curvature is using the calculus of variations. So I'm going to write down an energy functional. So j sub k of u. And so this is going to assume that the areas are 1. So there's different ways to write down this functional. and You'd think that this is a trivial change, and it is, except for the non-trivial part is keeping track of where the constants go, which is beyond me, right? And it turns out that the exact value of the constants at certain locations, certain places in this formula I'm going to write down is deeply significant. Okay, so here's, with this normalization, here's the uh, uh, 2k naught u, and then I'm going to have minus, uh, let me get, make sure I have the sign right, Again, I have to, okay, so it's minus k uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to think if I want to put this in. Well, let me put it, do it this way. So minus, uh, uh, no, excuse me, minus, no, minus k times log of uh, integral e to the 2u. I guess I want to do it that way. Yeah, so sorry, I'm, so I'm going to assume here that k is constant, but k naught is not. So let's just suppose that we're trying to solve uniformization on the sphere, right? With k is equal to constant, k naught is, you know, just whatever it is, we're on a smooth metric, and you write down this energy functional, okay? So there's a slightly modified form of this if you're trying to prescribe if k is a function, then k obviously has to go inside the integral in a certain way, but I will, I'll omit that. Okay, so let's just check that this has the right property. Namely, I want to compute its Euler-Lagrange equation. So suppose that, um, suppose we can prove that uh, j sub k of u is greater than or equal to uh, some constant for all u. And I'll be a little bit fuzzy about which u's I'm taking, but obviously I need the gradient of u to be in L2, I need this e to the 2u to be integrable, and so on. Okay. So suppose that that's true, and suppose we're even luckier and find out that, uh, that we can find a minimum of this functional. So we need this to be bounded below, and we also need a minimum. Okay? Suppose further uh, that some given function, maybe I'll call it u naught, minimizes j sub k. So then, you know, you do the standard trick, which is I take j sub k of u naught plus epsilon v, this is always greater than or equal to j sub k of u naught. So this is just a, a standard way of calculating the Euler-Lagrange equation. So this tells me that 
it's necessary that d by d epsilon at epsilon equals zero of j sub k of u naught plus epsilon v is equal to zero. And we can just go through and see what this integral of this derivative is. Here it is. It's going to be twice the integral of grad u naught dot grad v. That's from the first term. Minus 2k naught v. That's from this term. And then here I'm going to have minus, so sorry, I'm split it onto two lines, minus k uh, times 2 times, uh, and so I'm going to have 1 over the integral of e to the 2u because of the log, and then times uh, e to the 2u times v. And that's an integral here. Okay. So this is supposed to equal 0 for every choice of v, and if we isolate the uh, u naught, so you know this is the same as saying that the integral, so I have a factor of 2 that's common to everybody, and uh, oh dear, did I get my signs right? I certainly hope I got my signs right. I think I needed this to be a plus. Yeah, forgive me. Okay, so that's going to say the following, that I'm going to have uh, minus Laplacian u naught plus 2k naught minus 2k naught plus this, uh, excuse me, plus minus k naught plus k divided by this number times uh, e to the 2u, all multiplying v is equal to 0 for all v, and that implies that this expression is equal to 0. That's exactly the equation I want. This one. No, hold on for a second. So this should be a plus. That should be a plus, and that's what I want. Yes. Okay. Now let me see. So I, maybe I had the signs right. So sorry, now I've lost it completely. <laughs> okay. So let's see. So I want these signs to be opposite. So I want that to be a plus because when I integrate by parts, I want that to be a minus, and. I want this to have that when I integrate by parts, that to have the same sign as that. So, oh, right, so this is a minus because that was a minus there. <laughs> Saved. Okay. Okay, so we get this equation, and so the point is if we can find a minimizer, then we're, we're in good shape. Okay. Now, what's hard about this functional is the following, that you have this term. Please, yeah. Uh, so the area form with respect to g naught, g zero. So and that's why I'm assuming that. So there's extra terms which are sort of makes these integrals averages if it's if the area is non-zero, so if the area is not not equal to one. That's dividing by the area. That's dividing by the area of the new metric. So the integral of e to the two u is the integral of the new, of the new, is the area of the new metric. That's exactly right. Right. So right now I'm on the on a smooth surface. So right now I'm going to assume that uh, g naught is smooth, and then we're going to modify this. Yeah. But, so then no boundary terms, and in fact there won't be, and that has to be justified in the conic case. Yeah. But that's a good point. Okay. So it turns out that the crucial thing is that you have these two competing quantities, and this is, you know, if you can prove this, then this is sort of, I won't say easy, but it follows from more standard functional analysis. So the question is why is this bounded blow? And so you have this is a nice positive term. This is not very serious, right? But this is a possibly very unbounded negative term. Okay. So it turns out that there is a, a fundamental inequality called the uh, Moser-Trudinger inequality. Uh, which says the following, that um, so the logarithm of the integral of e to the 2 times u minus its average is bounded by 1 over 4 pi times the integral of grad u squared plus a constant. Okay. Now, I'm not going to uh, uh, describe the proof of this. I'll take this as a black box. This is written in many places. There's a nice book by um, Alice Chang that describes this in great detail, and I think I have it here. It's called, uh, well, it's a little book by the G European Math Society, um, and forgive me, I don't have the title off my top of my head. But this is a very standard fact. Some version of it is in Gilbarg and Trudinger, and so on. Okay, so this is a, you know, interesting inequality. It follows from uh, 
and is related to various other standard things. But the important thing here is this constant 1 over 4 pi. Okay. So what you do, so first of all, let me just sort of point out that uh, when we combine these two things here, so uh, let's see, where do we, uh, where do I start here? So, um, so suppose that if u bar, which is equal to the average of u divided by the area, is equal to zero. So just for simplicity, let's just consider functions whose average is zero. So then that's exactly the term that appears right here. Okay? And uh, so then what that's going to tell me is that the integral of uh, grad u squared minus k times log of integral of e to the 2u, which is uh, the thing that appears here, is going to be greater than or equal to. So I'm going to have a uh, 1 minus k over 4 pi times uh, um, uh, times the uh, times um, yeah times the integral of grad u squared sorry and then minus a constant okay so the point is here that you need k to be small if k is four pi it already looks kind of bad if k is bigger than four pi you're really in trouble okay this is unbounded below okay so somehow or another the role of sharp constants has a lot to do with this now what is k supposed to be here now, I'm going to uh, remind you, we have the area is equal to 1, or on a smooth surface, so the integral of k is equal to k times the area, which is equal to k, because the area is 1, that implies that uh, this integral is 2 pi times the Euler characteristic, so that's 4 pi. So the k I have here is, in fact, exactly critical, so 4 pi. Okay, so what do we do? Well, now, two things. Suppose that we arrange things so that this constant is positive. Right? Then I claim that you get this lower bound here. So the other term, and the, inner, the linear term in J sub K is, is, as I say, very easy to control. This moser Trudinger inequality implies that we have a lower bound for this thing, for all u in H1, so uh, one derivative uh, square integrable. And then we apply various compactness theorems. So it's Sobolev embedding and various versions of that to say that if I have a minimizing sequence, then we can extract a convergent subsequence. Okay? So really the whole key is this what's called coercivity, trying to get a lower bound on this functional. Okay? So now, how do I even do this in a smooth case where k is equal to 4 pi? So this leads people to sort of worry about can I make the constant better? Okay, can I make this constant better? Now it turns out that there are various improvements. So this is exactly the right constant on Euclidean space and on domains in Euclidean space. And then you can uh, sort of try to see what happens on surfaces. And it turns out that on, on, on uh, the sphere, for example, you can actually get a better constant. So here's a fact. On S2, uh, for actually a slightly more general class of things, so I can actually put in a variable function right here that would correspond to prescribing the scalar curvature instead of looking for uh, something, you would actually, uh, you can get a slightly better thing under a certain assumption. So if k of x is equal to its value at the antipodal point, then the constant is, for, is 8 pi. Okay, so you actually get a better, in, you get a better inequality. Uh, you get a smaller right-hand side. Uh, and that allows you to put a 1 over 8 pi here, and you're fine. Okay? Now, when k is constant, this is certainly true. Okay? But this theorem is applied in a more general context when you're trying to prescribe Gauss curvature. Okay, so this just shows that you take the basic inequality where you already have to work fairly hard to get the constant 4 pi, and then you have to work even harder to improve the constant. Okay? So this is the strategy. Uh, you get a lower bound, then you apply various compactness theorems, and you get a minimizer, and you've solved your problem. Of the, of, of the new guy, of the thing you're trying to find. Okay? So we want something that has curvature 4 pi, because that's going to be the standard constant curvature on a sphere of area 1. Okay, so suppose we do the same thing on the sphere, so I'm going to now, 
immediately assume that my manifold is a sphere. So this turns out to be the interesting case. So I assume, as I was doing here, but now with conic points, we didn't need to make this case. So I assume that m is equal to s2. I'll explain why I can reduce to this case. And I'm going to look at the conic situation. So I assume that all beta j's are negative. Okay. And uh, I want to do exactly the same thing. So I'm going to write down the same j sub k of u, the same energy. Okay. And we could follow the same strategy. You have to worry a little bit about, you know, Sobolev embedding theorems. And well, first of all, you have to worry about, is there an inequality like this? And there is, and in fact, there's an even better one is the point, okay? Or worse, depending on how you look at it. Um, but anyway, there's an inequality like this. And then all the theorems that lead to sort of compactness and being able to extract a convergent subsequence from a minimizing sequence go through. I mean, you have to do a little bit of work, but it's not very exciting. It's pretty straightforward, okay? So the big thing is, is the functional bounded from below? Okay. So. What Troyanov discovered, so this is a paper in uh, the late 80s, it was his thesis, um, and what he discovered was that there is actually a better, was there turning or inequality, and let me write it down for you. So, uh, so his, um, so, so I'm going to define a quantity, tau, and this is a, function of beta, and it's going to be the minimum of 2 and uh, um, 2 plus twice the minimum of the beta j's, beta i's. Okay? So there's something local about this because I'm not looking at every, so this is the minimum of these two things, I, so I take the quantity, uh, so all of the betas are negative. So just by definition, so he was trying to consider the case where betas, some of the betas could be positive. So if all the betas are negative, then this is automatically the guy that wins. Right? And so this is equal to 2 plus twice the minimum, two, 2 times 1 plus the minimum of the beta i's. This is strictly less than 2. Okay. And uh, so his big theorem was the following, that... So his real theorem was that you have, there is a moser trudinger inequality. With uh, 4 pi replaced by uh, 2 pi times this tau. Okay, so in other words, it's worse you know, that's a, you know, 4 pi times tau is less than 4 pi in our case because this thing is less than 2. So 1 over it is bigger. So there's, uh, it's, a, it's a worse inequality, but there's sort of a different amount of room. Okay, so what happens if we try to do the same thing, if we try to understand the coercivity of this functional? So you run through exactly the same argument. So suppose you have unit area. What is the integral of k? Well, it's no longer 4 pi, but it's 2 pi times the conic Euler characteristic. So what we need, so what we need for coercivity, for lower boundedness, for j sub k is greater or equal to minus c, that, uh, well, it's going to be 1 minus, and then I'm going to have the conic Euler characteristic times 2 pi divided by 2 pi times tau of beta is strictly greater than 0. So namely, this is the new constant that comes out in front. So this is the replacement for this right here. So we no longer have any, we can't fool around with sort of talking about even functions or anything like that because I'm on a conic surface. And this is the quantity that we need. And so that's, of course, exactly the statement that chi of m beta is less than tau of beta. Okay, and let's write that out. So that's, well, chi of m is 2 because we're on the sphere. So I have 2 plus uh, the sum beta i. i goes from 1 to k. And this is supposed to be strictly less than 2 plus the minimum of uh, beta, I, uh, beta i. Okay, the 2's cancel. Right? 
And let's suppose that this is a cane at some fixed index j. So I'm going to have the sum i goes from 1 to k of beta i is less than 2 times beta j for some particular j. That's the guy that realizes the minimum. And then I take it away from this side. What I'm going to get is that beta j is greater than the sum i goes from 1 to k. i is not equal to j of beta i. And that is exactly the Troyanov constraint. So here we've seen it exactly analytically. So I, something which we saw geometrically before appears as getting this analytic condition here. OK? So here, um, for this minimum to be this, all you need is that there's some negative beta i. Yeah, so in fact, there's some negative beta i. And so his so theorem is applied. Is right. the sphere part that's supposed to be the take on just all being negative? No, so in fact, yeah, so basically that's right. That's exactly right. But this is the condition that we really need. OK, so when we're not the sphere, I'm going to actually show you a different method to, uh, to get existence no matter what. OK, but uh, anyway, so this is, the, this is the condition, and it turns out to be exactly the same as that geometric condition I got before. So I think this is a very beautiful correspondence, because something that we saw from a Gauss-Binet calculation appears, appears here. OK, now I'm not going to get into the guts of that proof, because you know, it's one of those sort of lengthy things, and I'd spend the rest of the uh, uh, hour doing that. So um, just to sort of sketch that that's how the, the existence goes. So in the case where all the beta i's are negative and this condition is satisfied, you have a lower bound from this, and then you apply the standard method of the calculus of variations to get an infimum, and there's your solution. Okay. So last bit about... Uh, last uh, fact about uh, all beta i negative, let me say last facts about all beta i less than zero. So one is you have uniqueness in all cases. OK, well, I'm lying because I told you that in the flat case, we have no way to normalize. So you can take any flat conic metric and scale it. So let's forget about that. But in the hyperbolic case, in the constant curvature minus one case, we can uh, uh, get uniqueness using the maximum principle. And in the spherical case, well, it's not at all obvious. I told you the maximum principle just doesn't work here. And in fact, it's uh, sort of a harder theorem. So this is, uh, so in k equals plus one, this is due to uh, Luo and Tian in the late 90s. OK, and they were adapting ideas from higher dimensional Taylor, Taylor geometry, sort of uniqueness theorem for Taylor-Einstein metrics that they made work in this one complex dimensional singular context. OK, and again, it's, it's a somewhat long proof. I suspect that there's probably a much shorter geometric proof. And actually, I was just talking about that with Alex yesterday. But uh, I don't know one right off the top of my head. OK, so that's uh, one fact. The second thing you might ask is, uh, what about the moduli of these metrics? So I've sort of given you an existence theorem, but I haven't told you how they fit together. So there's a theorem that the moduli space, so there is, so let me just sort of state very roughly, there is a good Teichmuller theory. In the sense that I can define a space, so I'm going to call it, you know, M conic. And maybe I should call it M conic less than 2 pi, OK? And in fact, I want to throw all the possible parameters in here. So the point is that one thing that's interesting here is you have the genus of the surface, which is always fixed, and that constrains things in the normal smooth case. Here you can vary the cone angles. And you know, if you just think about you know, chi of m beta, you know, for a given surface, even if the Euler characteristic is negative, I can choose cone angles even less than 2 pi. I can add a whole, uh, let me see. So when I'm on the sphere, I can make this positive or zero or negative. OK, so it, in principle, if I look at this whole space here, and I don't normalize the curvature to be plus 1, minus 1, or 0, I can sort of get a whole continuum. And so the claim is this is a smooth manifold. Of dimension. OK, so what should be its dimension? So 6g minus 6 for the underlying moduli. So let me talk about it when you have high genus. So 6g minus 6. Right? Then I'm going to have k points wandering around, and then each point has a, uh, has a cone angle, so plus 3k. Okay. Okay. 
And uh, in fact, you can say much more. It sort of fibers over. And the, the, the sort of point is, is that nothing very interesting happens in this cone angle less than 2 pi case. So namely, it looks perfectly nice. The one sort of nice observation about this, so this is something I proved with um, Hartman Weiss. Because 2k, because you have k points with two param, uh, excuse me, yes, yeah, I'm doing real, real dimension, two points, but then each one has a cone angle. So if I just say conic, but without specifying what the cone angle is, right? So I'm allowing any curvature, any cone angle. So the point is, if I fix the area to be something, you know, I can either sort of fix the area, fix the curvature, or fix neither. But this is sort of the right dimension count when I k is the number of points. So I should have put that maybe conic k. Too many indices, but and, uh, you're letting beta be anything. I'm letting beta be anything. Less than two, but less than zero. That's exactly right. So um, the one interesting observation about this. So as I say, it's not a well. It's an interesting space, but it's no more interesting than Teichmuller space itself is, <laughs> or a moduli space itself. I can mod out by a uh, mapping class group. But um, the 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 interesting thing is that this interpolates. between the smooth case that's all beta j are equal to zero and uh, the standard marked uh, Teichmuller space so the marked case that's all beta j equal minus one okay so I didn't explicitly talk about the minus one limit but what's happening is uh, to a cone angle so here's our cone angle so you have two possible limits of this when you're when beta j is less than zero one is is that this converges to just a cone over a circle of radius of circumference two pi that's a flat surface i mean it's perfectly smooth the other thing it can do is this cone angle can go to zero and in fact what will happen is that this will then go to a hyperbolic cusp okay so suppose that the uh euler characteristic of m is of uh m is negative so we know that there are so, well, in fact, even on the sphere. And uh, you have enough points, so it's just you're in the stable range where you have uh, a hyperbolic metrics. So these cone metrics sort of naturally interpolate between smooth metrics and these things. So buried in this statement is sort of a, an analytic proof of the fact that the space of you know, finite area complete metrics is, uh, is uh, a nice moduli space. Of course, well known, but it actually bizarrely hadn't, didn't seem to have been done in the, uh, in the uh, sort of using methods of uh, geometric analysis rather than complex analysis. Okay. Well, so um, obstructions to the deformation theory, right? So what's sort of behind this theorem here is I just look at the local deformations and, you know, basically it should be an implicit function theorem argument. So I have a bunch of parameters. So, you know, if you think about what you might want to do, so suppose I fix... So I have M, and I fix the points P1 through PK, uh, beta 1 through beta K. Right? And then I look at sort of nearby arrangements. So I want to vary them. Now, one thing that I can do is I can just sort of choose local variations, the P's. So I can let them vary. So there's sort of K disks that they wander around in. And I can let the cone angles vary in intervals. So I have this sort of extra 3K dimensional deformation space. Now, let's suppose that G0 is a solution for this given arrangement. So this has constant curvature and the right cone angles at the right positions. Okay. So then I vary things a little bit. So I try to find, uh, so. Yeah, so, but that's an open condition. That's sort of buried in here. Yeah, so I mean, this is subject to, you know, it's a smooth manifold, but you know, all the betas have to satisfy Troinov. But the point is, is actually, and I should have said this also, the Troinov condition is independent of the location of the points, right? So it just looks like, you know, so the point is, is that the extra k dimensions from the angles, it just is sort of a product. Okay, and it, now it's just sort of a, a piece of the cube instead of the whole cube when you're in the spherical case. Okay, so I first find a family of metrics, so let's call it G0 Q alpha. So let's suppose that Qs are the deformation of the Ps and the alphas are the deformation of the betas, right? So I just find metrics like this, which are, let's say, constant curvature out here, but then I've sort of screwed them up a little bit in these disks. Okay, so I just vary them a little bit, and then I try to find 
a new, fa you know, a new conformal factor to make this a new solution with the, the new cone angles and the new positions. Okay? Now, uh, what I do is, I, you know, what you'd like to do is just sort of linearize the problem and apply the implicit function theorem. So it turns out that there are a number of, number of difficulties which are kind of analytic and have to do with this theory of conic operators. But here's the key point, here's the key problem, that the, this deformation theorem, so we can apply the implicit function theorem, provided, and there's this kind of weird condition, that Laplacian g naught plus 2 of phi equals 0 has no solution. Namely, 2 is not in the spectrum. Okay. Now, I have to talk, when I'm on a conic surface, I need to still talk a little bit about what I mean about the Laplacian as a self-adjoint operator. So in some sense, that involves imposing boundary conditions at the conic points. So I haven't told you that yet, but there's a way to make it into a self-adjoint operator, apl applying what's called the Friedrichs extension. It has a discrete spectrum, looks just the same as before, and it turns out that this condition is necessary and sufficient for this deformation theory to go, go through. Okay. Now here's another very nice fact that actually relates to this Alexandrov ge geometry that I talked about before. So if the curvature is equal to plus one, uh, and all beta j's are negative, then the spectrum of the Laplacian, of minus Laplacian g, g equals zero, lambda one, lambda two, et cetera. So it's a discrete set. What would this be in the smooth case? Well, you have zero. The first non-zero eigenvalue is two, exactly the bad guy. It turns out that under these conditions, lambda one is strictly greater than two. Okay, so that's an eigenvalue estimate that actually, uh, well, it, it, you know, I, I, uh, um, I won't discuss the proof of this, but there's a way of estimating eigenvalues using, um, uh, using integration by parts of the eigenfunctions. And precisely because in the case where beta j's are negative, this bad condition never happens, and so you always have an unobstructed deformation theory, and that's why this, this turns out to be a nice smooth moduli space. Become what? Uh, yeah, so indeed, well, so we're looking in the case where beta j's are negative, so that they never are allowed quite to become smooth. So that only happens in the limit. Of course, you could do that, and that's sort of at the boundary of this space. Yeah. I'll be talking about that later. Yeah, but you can do that, of course. But that's not sort of strictly included in this. Yeah, you could, yeah. That's exactly right. Well, so you sort of think about the following thing is that, you know, the fiber you have at each point. So you sort of think about, let's suppose that we're on a g greater than one surface, right? And you let the cone angles uh, vary from zero to two pi, right? So you can sort of think of, you have a k-dimensional cube, which is a cube of cone angles. Up here at this angle where all the betas are zero, you have the ordinary smooth Teichmuller space. You don't have the 3K. That's exactly right. So it's a higher co-dimension corner. This is a cube of dimension 3K, right? And, and you've actually, excuse me, this is, well, I'm going to say, all of those points have disappeared. So it's, it's a corner there. And then down here, you see a lower co-dimension corner where just the angles have, you know, all the angles have gone to zero, but you still have the locations of the points. So, the, you know, it's kind of a funny interpolation, but as you move up the various edges, you can let some of the angles disappear to 2 pi or not. So, you know, it's a space that kind of contains these as two different corners. Are so you that's all I meant. Use the same calculus of differential operators at the cone points, like yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so that's sort of what's behind this deformation theorem. Okay, so it's exactly this eigenvalue estimate, and this is sort of the thing that you need to make the implicit function theorem work. Okay, good. Any other questions? Yeah. So, no, that's uh, uh, the point is that typically it's, uh, you can do this within a conformal class. Yeah, so absolutely you can. 
So that's sort of another thing that makes this simple, is you can always stay within a conformal class. And the way you can stay within a conformal class, because you're again in two dimensions, you can sort of take z minus this qj to a power 2 alpha j. This is sort of the extra factor, but that's a conformal factor, but the underlying conformal metric is smooth. It's fixed. That's exactly right, and that's a good point. Okay, so um, the next thing I want, so, okay, so there's the theory for cone angles less than 2 pi sort of fully. Now, the one part which I've omitted is sort of the representation theoretic point of view, and I'm actually going to be getting to that either uh, at the beginning of um, the lecture tomorrow or at the end of lecture today. Okay, so there's a whole group representation point of view, which is uh, quite interesting and important for this. And as I um, made my disclaimer at the beginning, this is a very analytic take on this whole subject. Okay, now I want to pursue the uh, line of thought that I talked about um, for proving existence in the spherical case to tell you about another very beautiful theorem by uh, um, Alessandro Carlotto and uh, Andrea Malchiotti uh, in the case where the cone angles are bigger than 2 pi. So what can be done? So the case that's really open to us, and this is really what I'm going to focus on now, is uh, sum or all beta j's are greater than 0. Okay. Now, what that's actually going to mean is that you're not going to have this coercivity or lower bound. So the real condition that you're worried about is when is it true that chi of m beta is greater than or greater than or equal to this tau beta. So this is the condition. Suppose we drop this condition. So then you can actually check by very explicit example. You can just write down explicit functions. Jk of u is unbounded below. And let me sort of explain to you what, what are the bad guys, what causes that. So namely, you can write down a function. So here I have this conic surface. It's doing whatever. And suppose that um, here is a, a, a beta, and this is sort of the thing that makes this condition violate. OK, so it's the minimum of the beta i's. OK, well, what you can do is you can actually choose a u uh, u sub lambda, I'm going to call it, and I can write down an explicit formula for you here. Um, <laughs> somewhere here. No, I'm sorry, I cannot write down an explicit formula. Uh, OK, so what it is is there's going to be a phenomenon of bubbling. So you're going to find a u sub lambdas, and these things are sort of concentrating right here. So you're going to find functions u sub lambda, which are very small on the rest of the surface. In fact, I just transplant them to be supported near this particular cone point. They're getting very big, and then they uh, go off to 0 here. And in the limit, so there's an explicit formula. And you know this formula is just something like so, log of uh, one plus uh, lambda plus the distance from uh, p j to z or something like that. So this is not the exact formula, but it has this kind of flavor. Okay. So lambda appears in a very explicit way, and it's a very elementary formula in terms of the distance on these surfaces. So u sub lambda concentrates near uh, this point p j. And the limit of uh, e to the 2u lambda times g naught is equal to, well, geometrically, what's happening is that u lambda is going to 0 everywhere else. So everywhere, everything else on the surface gets suppressed. All I'm going to see is sort of a neighborhood of this. And it's going to just correspond to a football. So here's 2 pi times 1 plus beta j. So in other words, what's happening is that you just uh, bubble off a football at that point. Lambda is going to infinity. Okay. So you're in the positive curvature case? I'm in the positive curvature case, very much so. That's, so we've solved the problem completely in the case of negative or zero curvature. We found unique solutions, so that can never happen. So we're always in the positive curvature case. Okay. okay, so this is sort of the bad guy, and that's exactly corresponding to this. The energy of these u sub lambdas are going to minus infinity, and you have bubbling. OK, so the theorem I want to explain briefly of Carlotto and Marchiotti. So, 
It's known, and that was the theorem I already proved. Oh, well, actually, so if the chi of m beta, so, okay. Let me state this theorem, and then, and then I'll, uh, you'll see how it's known through this theorem, okay? So the theorem of Carlotta and Marchioti. is uh, suppose that um, uh, uh, m is not equal to s2. So it exactly does not work in this case, right? Then uh, j, k of u has critical points which can be obtained by a min-max method. Okay, so remember that to get solutions out of J sub K, all I cared about was that it was a critical point. If it was a minimum, great, that's certainly a critical point. But as long as you find a critical point, you're in good shape. Okay, so what they needed to do was to find, so you have a function that's unbounded above, certainly, it always is, and unbounded below. And you have to find saddle points. And they did this by a very interesting topological argument. So there's a topological argument, which is essentially Morse theoretic. So a topological argument. So we look at the space H1 of the surface. Okay, and this is sort of where J is defined. Okay, so J is defined in H1. So J maps H1 to R, and it's, uh, it covers all of R. It's unbounded below as well as above. So what you're going to do is you're going to look at two level sets. You're going to look at J less than or equal to uh, some constant c. So you're going to call this uh, lambda sub c. So you're going to look at the sublevel set. And you're going to look at two limiting cases. So the first case is when c is very positive. Okay? And then you can sort of explicitly show that the set is connected, contractible. So then lambda sub c is contractible. Okay, and you just do that very explicitly. You show that you can sort of deform one thing to another, and you screw up the energy a little bit, but you can always do it making the energy stay bounded below the two constants. Okay. So the uh, interesting thing is what happens when C is very negative. So, so if U is in J sub C, where C is very negative, then in fact you can get a profile for what U looks like. So things that have very negative energy basically look like this, okay? Well, maybe not single bubbles, but they look like multiple bubbles. So in fact, then U is concentrated in uh, L small regions that may or may not be clustered around conic points, so small regions. And so, you know, basically here's the surface without showing where the conic points are. They're sort of clustered like this. Okay. So in other words, what's happening is, roughly speaking, as C goes to minus infinity, the elements of the sublevel set are getting very close to sort of formal sums of delta functions on the surface. Okay. So now we want to understand what's the topology of the set J sub C. Right. And basically what they first prove is this lemma that U is up to sort of extremely small errors. It can only be big in these sort of well-separated regions. And so then you can ask, what's the topology of the space of formal barrier centers? And the number L is sort of predicted by C and the genus and so on. So um, if I look at the set of uh, AJ times delta Q, uh, uh, J, J goes from 1 to L, I just look at the set of formal points on the surface, and I can ask, does it have Topology, and the answer precisely when m is not equal to s2 is that you can actually calculate what the homotopy groups of that are. So this is sort of this is non-trivial topologically. Okay, so so the set of these things, which is a very good approximation to elements of the sublevel set, have topology. Okay, so you have the situation that the sublevel set down here, you can actually calculate some of its homotopy groups, and they're non-trivial. If I go up here, right? So suppose that you know pi sub uh, 3 is non is non-zero, pi sub 2 is non-zero, okay? If I go up here, I have a contractible space. So somewhere here, there must be something happening to 
kill the topology. And how you can detect that is you take two parameter families. So if pi 2 is non-zero, I take two parameter families of solutions. So I take u of, uh, let me call my parameters t1 and t2, two parameter families of solutions down here. And I know that they're contractible if I allow the energy to go up. So I take the minimum on each element like this. I take the, uh, excuse me, I take the maximum energy on each one of these families, and then I take the minimum of all families. So I take a non-trivial homotopy class down here. So excuse me, if this is an S2, right? So I take a two-parameter family, right? Then I take a disk which fills it, but it fills it in at the expense of going to very high energy. Okay, so for every filling by a disk, I take the maximum energy on that disk. It's less than the big value. This is plus C and this is minus C, right? And then I take the infimum over all such disks. Okay, so this is a minimax strategy. You have to worry about why should that point, you found a sequence of functions, why should they converge? So you found a sequence of functions. These correspond to, you know, the successive maxima of these various families. And, you know, what I'm hoping is that there's some sort of mountain pass, and I'm going to be hitting exactly that mountain pass. Okay. So, an analysis yet again, what they prove is that, uh, so for functions that look like this, so basically they show that for functions that look like this, these sort of well-centered clumps, there's an even better constant in the moser turdinger inequality. So they get a, so they improve the constant in moser trudinger And what that's going to tell me, so I mean, that, there's a lot that goes into here. And so again, I'm just giving you a very rough idea because of course these were the things with very negative energy. These things do not have very negative energy, but one dangerous situation that could happen is that the minimum of all of these maxima are still going to minus infinity, are still getting very negative, right? But if they get very negative, then they look like this. And things that look like this have a better constant. And you can get coercivity, and you can, you can show that there's a lower bound. Okay? So it's a very intricate argument, but basically they show that these minimaxes stay bounded below, right? So they can't get too high, obviously, and they, and they can't go to minus infinity, and then you have to do a little bit more work, which is easier to show that they actually converge. Okay, so it's a very clever minimax argument, but it's uh, using the fact that you have an improved constant that's really based on, that's only valid for functions that are sort of supported in these well-separated well clumps. Okay, so that's just an idea of what happens. Um, so after this theorem, what this gives us is uh, existence except for on the sphere, okay? doesn't say anything about uniqueness, and that's sort of one of the big open questions. But it just says I can choose the points anywhere I want. I can run this, minimum, you know, this energy scheme, and I find minimax solutions regardless of the points with a given cone angle. Okay? doesn't say anything about uniqueness. So what I'm going to be spending the rest of my lectures on is the last remaining case where I just have the sphere. So let me just state this now. So I have m is equal to s2. Right, uh, arbitrary betas, k is equal to plus one. So obviously the betas have to satisfy the Euler characteristic constraint that two plus the sum of the betas is positive. Okay, so the question is, what can we say about existence or uniqueness? So what I'll be talking about are uh, two theorems. So let me just as a preview for what I'll be doing the next two days. Um, so one theorem, one is a. Uh, quite elegant argument by Mandela and Panov. So this is a, uh, a paper that um, really uses mostly synthetic geometry. Uh, so just piecing together things and some sort of soft analytic arguments, but really no, no real analysis, that gives, a, uh, gives um, a necessary and essentially sufficient condition on the set of cone angles. So I can just ask, forget about the points. So forget about the points altogether. And I just ask which k tuples of cone angles are necessary in order for there to be a solution. Now, what I talked about yesterday was that there was this, you know, 
it's what I call a dual gauss binet condition, which turned into the Troyanov condition. So there were constraints. So what are the generalizations of the Troyanov constraints? And they found those, and they did this by converting to a problem of finding piecewise uh, geodesics on S3. So it turns out broken geodesics on S3, the space of those things turns out to be equivalent to this in a certain sense. And that uses uh, the holonomy representation. So I'll describe that tomorrow. Okay, so that's the first uh, step. There's some modifications. So this is a set of linear conditions, and you have to understand what happens on the boundary. They understood what happened in the interior, and this um, was improved by uh, Day and Kapovich. So they gave um, some nice and very geometric arguments to say that what happens on the boundary is nothing interesting. You, you don't get solutions. Everything degenerates to footballs. Okay, and then the last thing, and I'll stop here, is... Uh, can one specify, so this is sort of part two, can one specify the locations of the points? And similarly, can one count solutions? Okay, so I'll give you what's known about this. So this is sort of an ongoing project I'm doing with Xu uh, and Zhu. And uh, so we have quite a lot of results about this. So I'll describe these over the next two days. Sufficient. Out of, and it's, out yeah, of the right. Schrodinger. Yep. And then you just showed us now that in this situation you have these, these metrics that concentrate around one of right. the problems, and you get a better Moser Schrodinger. Is there a proof that more geometric proof of Moser Schrodinger that's based on going from this football kind of argument? Or is there Not that I'm aware of. You know, I, there may well be. I've never thought about that. There may well be. Um, I mean, but the the. You know, this thing about when you have sort of these multi-bumps and you get sort of a better inequality is really based on sort of applying localized things. And you get, an, you get a constant that looks like um, if you have L points, then the constant turns out to be something like 1 over 4 pi times L plus 1 or something like that. So it's basically showing that, you know, all the error terms go away and that you really can just apply this L times over in a certain sense. So... But so the proof um, here about, you know, the, the constraints they give, they're sort of complicated polyhedral constraints on the betas. I don't know sort of a similar Gauss-Binet type argument for that. But they transform it to something very geometric, as I say. You know, they use the holonomy representation, which I'll describe, and they say that any spherical conic surface corresponds to, you know, a broken geodesic in S3, a closed, a closed polygon. So I take, a, you know, a family of geodesics that have corners, and then it comes back and comes back to itself. And then you can just study that problem abstractly about what are the closed polygonal paths in S3. And there's sort of generalized triangle inequalities for those, and that's what these things are.